Welcome to Polyglot Podcast. I'm Christian, and today I have Conrad here as my guest. Welcome, Conrad. Thank you very much, Christian. How I don't even I don't even know if I told you about this podcast that much. So, do you know where you are now, or what we're meant to <laughs> talk about? I have some idea, uh, yeah. a little bit. Uh, it's about languages, uh, right? Yeah. So. Um, I've recorded more than 40 episodes now. Wow. And my idea is to invite people from all the countries and territories of the world and speak about mm. their uh, home countries, uh, language situation by their own example and also about their That's own, right. about the guests' own language background and their own like travels and where they have mm. lived. So I was thinking that you, as a Tanzanian would could talk about the situation in Tanzania and how you ended up here uh, in the warm <laughs> Finland with all the palm trees and the nice ocean. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But uh, so usually I start with the question, what was the first language you learned? Oh, well, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh... Like your mother tongue. So, so when you started learning, yeah so yeah you know my mother tongue is Swahili so I, yeah. I am from Tanzania and and um, the in Tanzania we speak Swahili as our national language and uh, that is my mother tongue uh, I didn't learn it as the first language but I uh, speak Pick it fluently, and I learn it also in school uh, quite quite much. It's taught um, in schools. Um, so English is an official language in the country, and is spoken by many people. So I also learn quite a lot in English, uh, and also uh, uh, at home in many occasions. Uh, but uh, you cannot avoid uh, the national language. So we spoke all the time. Uh, Swahili with friends uh, and of course the school but you know to learn the proper Swahili then you need uh, proper education which then I did I think I did it um, officially when I was in my high school yeah yeah but which language your mom and dad spoke to you before you spoke Swahili yeah well uh, uh it's a mix of languages. My parents, my, especially my dad, spoke English quite a lot. Uh, my mother spoke Swahili, and that's why we could speak Swahili. And in Tanzania, during our time, uh, learning Swahili was, uh, at, at least in schools, Swahili was a kind of uh, just a course, but learning especially um, Swahili as the content language was mostly stressed I think in your high school or junior high school you know we have these seven primary school years where you're learning how to read and so forth so that you do after your class during our time three or so yeah. um, and then um, after that where you go to the secondary school then you're learning the deep roots of the language and so forth. But then nursery schools and and um, uh, three first classes, these vary a lot with what school you went. And well, I think it's due to the British influence. There are so many of those that are only educating in, in English. Uh, and of course- uh, Also as, in your school? Yes, I have part of those, uh, those as well. And- um, uh, the textbooks, for example, in many uh, uh, many things are only in English. Yeah. Uh, during our time, for example, I remember when I was in class six uh, or seven, uh, you could have a, a book, science book, fully written in Swahili. Mm -hmm. uh, so speaking the language itself uh, was not an issue because you yeah. go to the streets, you meet people, you speak. You go to uh, sports activities, and of course, you have your parents at home. Yeah. Uh, but learning it as a learning language, um, I think deeply, at least for me, started when I was in a secondary school. Yeah, okay. And uh, I think it's uh, important to mention where in Tanzania 
did you grow up? Because I mean, Tanzania is it's huge. <laughs> Tanzania is huge. Yes. Hmm. Um. <laughs> mostly, my life uh, has been in Dar es Salaam, uh, so the uh, the coastline of of Tanzania mainland, uh, and uh, I have touched the southern highlands and um, also the. Uh, the southern Tanzania close to the Mozambique the time to, to, to time but um, I am originally from Kilimanjaro so oh. Kilimanjaro is where my parents my, my grandparents or my parents were born um, okay so yeah Arusha Moshi some Moshi ah Mo Moshi village yes Moshi district okay so your both parents are from Moshi district yes oh uh, how many times have you climbed the Kilimanjaro? <laughs> <laughs> or ha have you done yeah. it? Yeah, I have. I have climbed it. I have climbed it once in 2003, if not four. Yeah. Yes, but I've seen it many times. <laughs> yeah. uh, so your parents are from Moshi, but do you, was it also the town where, where you were born and spent the first years? Or did you no. were you born mm. in Dar es Salaam? Dar es Salaam. Ah, okay, yes. okay. So your parents had already moved to Dar es Salaam when you were born. Yeah, you, you are, of course, uh, <laughs> and many other places. But um, uh, so Dar es Salaam is a capital, uh, or no, economic capital of the country. And so many times when you graduate, I think during their time also, and you have an important job somewhere, then that's the hub where your job could be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This, um, my parents are on their 70, mid 70s now. These, um, let's say, countryside areas like Kilimanjaro and so forth could offer you jobs, obviously, but most of the time those jobs were to do with the associations or development uh, of agriculture or this type of things. Yeah. But having economists uh, in, in the house and administrative people, they always worked in, uh, uh, obviously, big or international companies in in in, in the Islam and in other places. Yeah, uh, do your parents speak some regional languages? Because, uh, like yes. you know, we have a common half Tanzanian Finnish friend whose uh, mom is actually from Bukoba. So I know uh, my friend's mom speaks Kihaya as the first mm -hmm. language and then Swahili, English, and other languages. That's right. So uh, I was uh, wondering what regional languages your parents speak at some level? They speak very well. Um, they were born and raised uh, throughout their, I think, until uh, 20. Or, uh, let's say so. So they were born and raised until their primary school completed in Kilimanjaro. Yeah. And our regional language is called Chaga. Chaga? Yes. And our tribe is Wachaga, right? Wachaga. Uh, Wachaga means the Chaga people. Mm. Um, so uh, they speak perfectly, very well. And I have to say that um, my dad, I think, went to study out of Tanzania already when he was in secondary school. Um, if I remember correct, it was in Nairobi or some East African country. And there was no Swahili during the time. Yeah. Because Kenya uh, and Com yeah, is, is maybe more affected by the Commonwealth than uh, any other, Kenya and Uganda, uh, than any other East African countries. Oh, okay. Yeah, so he swarmed into an English-speaking uh, territory a lot yeah and that's the language he has used also to work the whole time and that's the language that he used most of the time also at home <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah because he 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 kind of lived longer into the language and it needed mm. him more and but my mother went to uh, high school as well and in, in uh in um uh or well, at least junior secondary school in, in, in Kilimanjaro. Uh, and so she has much more uh, roots in, into the, into the uh, local society. But together at home, for example, they spoke 
in the traditional regional language. Chagas. So in the, yeah, in many, many cases, and especially most in those things that they didn't wish us to understand, they, they spoke in regional languages. <laughs> yeah. Do you do you speak or understand Chaga? Yes, uh, I understand very well. Uh, I can speak uh, to fifty percent. <laughs> My Finnish is better than Chaga. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, because it wasn't really in the in the center of our our home, yeah. and the problem is only because Tanzania has Swahili language as the cross cutting language in the whole country. So Swahili was much more spoken, like my mother would speak Swahili and uh, neighbors and friends uh, in many uh, circles uh, uh, than if you go to a friend and you could not find so many Chaga friends. Well, you find them, but they will speak Swahili to you. And uh, having lived part of my life also in, in uh, Dar es Salaam, uh, Dar es Salaam is a coastal region where the people who speak Swahili are originated from, uh, mm. uh, in, in a sense. Um, so uh, it was obvious that that is a stronger language. But I understand the regional language as well. I can follow and I can speak some words. At least with my grandmothers, we have spoken it, even though my, my grandmother spoke Swahili as well. So yes. Yeah. Okay, I have never heard about Chaga language uh -huh. and i know quite a lot about languages uh, is chaga language in the same language family as uh, swahili is it the bantu language the bantu <laughs> well uh that's a difficult question i don't know how to classify yeah. it but i think it is because um, i'm trying to think very carefully here uh, because I think I know where the origin of this language yeah. came from, if I am I, I'm, I'm correct. Uh, but I think it's a Bantu language because this is the most uh, classified languages for the African mm -hmm. uh, society. Uh, but uh, the pronunciation can be a little bit um, accental, how do you say, it has more accent. Um, and you can mix consonants as well, quite a lot, like Finnish language. Um, um, but um, how, simil example, how similar is it to Swahili? Um, there are some words. Uh, uh, for example, if you want to say it in Swahili, you will say kula. And in Chaga, it will be Lia. Okay. You see? Yeah. So if you are sitting in a Swahili world, 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 you will see that there are some similarities there. Uh, but it's kind of just remove the K, put L, and finish the end. I don't know how to, to symbolize okay. that in terms of, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so in that case, there, there are some uh relations in in some mm -hmm. some ways um and then if i give another example uh, which could be different totally different if you want to say thank you you say asante but in, in chaga you will say aika aika mm -hmm. like time which in finnish aika it is time in finland <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> yes so it's it's it sits in and out, and I think it's because most of the people from Chaga, our heritage, are, are from Ethiopia. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, that's another story. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So when um, you hear the Ethiopian dialects and Chaga dialects, there can be some far away hints here and there. Yeah. Uh, and then the Chaga took some Swahili, and there are so many of these intermingling. Uh, yeah, which is I think that's the. Can I ask a few uh, phrases? So, uh, I will try to say something in Swahili that I <laughs> remember, so you can tell it uh, in Chaga if you know. Oh my God! I'll so, uh, <laughs> so Habari. So isn't Habari like hello, and then you answer in many yeah. ways like in Habari Swahili? Is Habari. Like hello, and then you answer Mzuri. Mzuri. Uh, and in. Uh, in Chaga, uh, you could say Shimboni. Shimboni, okay. Mm -hmm. What about the, so my name is Christian, is uh, Jinalanguni Christian? 
right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And um, <laughs> yes, in Chaga, how will that be? Um, I think I know that. Uh, trying to <laughs> figure out the best pronunciation. Uh, um, <laughs> it's a bit of a phrase. Um, um, something like Gilawo Conrad, like I'm I am called Conrad. It comes like in that way. Mm. Uh, Gilawo Christian, something. Yeah, something like that. Okay. okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, and Tutao uh, Nana Badai. See you later. Is it was it correct? Did I? Yeah, that's from Badai. Um, or any like goodbye. Like, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I I understand what you mean. I'm trying to to figure out the best yeah. <laughs> phrase. There are several okay. phrases on this. Okay. Um, because, for example, in the evening, you will say, <laughs> oh my God, I hope I have it correctly. Like, crack you. Crack you. Yeah, good night, mom, or see you, mom. And then um, uh, in daytime, for example, if you meet a friend and see you later, would be something like, um, uh, let's see. Um, you know, there is a chugger phrase definitely for that. Uh, I cannot just recall, but you can also say, Luonana uh, Badai. Badai is a Swahili, but Luonana, uh, like we will see you later. Something like that. Uh, it cannot be, it's maybe not so correct yeah. uh, in terms of uh, phrasing it. Uh, mm -hmm. And and yes, uh, I am from the Marangu area, so some of these words will differ from the people who are coming oh. from Machame areas of the same Moshi will differ from uh, the people who are coming from, uh, let's say, um, uh, Kibosho areas. So, yeah. so there are these areas, um, uh, for example, also, you asked about how are you doing in, in our area, you could say, Nomcha, are you fine? Mm -hmm. Something like it. Yeah. So there they can be many of these, but Ruan uh, Anabada is like, see you later. Uh, we will see you later. But I'm, I'm, there is a phrase which is running my brain, but since I haven't spoken this for yeah. more than 20 years, it's kind of... Yeah, it's a phrase which is exactly the chaga word by word. Mm -hmm. uh, to say, to say yeah. Uh, do you remember? Or you do can you know say also. Yeah. Uh, let's say now I know the words. When you finish uh, speaking, uh, you can tell to somebody, "Hey, uh, kilalao, kilalao." Like, see you later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Kilalao. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and something you, like that. Do you know yeah. how many people speak Chaga? Like hmm. estimation. Oh. Is it like uh, millions or hundreds of thousands or millions. tens of thousands? Uh... I think millions. Yeah. Or one million or close to one million. Yeah. I think it's beyond. Uh, yeah. I need to check the statistics. I think it's beyond. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, then it's uh, yeah, not that small. Like, for example, I'm currently studying Northern Sami. Which is only spoken uh -huh. by four forty thousand people. Yeah. Yeah. Did you find some statistics? I will quickly check because I think. How do you write so many... Chaga? Is... Yeah. So T T C H A double G A. But I think I only get the pictures of the speaker. T. Mm. What was it? T C H A G G A. G G yeah. yeah. So you found 
a DJ or a musician. <laughs> yes. I cannot find any any language. Yeah, maybe the orthography uh, varies a bit. Maybe. Yeah, uh, you can use also C H G G A. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's not the right way to write okay. uh, the, the name, but um, yeah. yeah. And I can see, I can already confirm that it's a Bantu language. <laughs> Somebody has written it. But I think it's spoken to, uh, uh, according to 1988, it's 800,000. So okay. it's already beyond 1 million people. Oh, yeah. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important to mention that uh, Swahili is spoken by, I, I mean, the estimations vary a lot. There are some mm -hmm. estimations uh, which uh, tell it it's spoken by more than 100 million, but in Wikipedia it says uh, native speakers, 18 million, and uh, second language speakers, 55. So that's in total like 70, 80 million. But I've seen also some... Yes. Oh, yeah, the, I found something that says it's estimated to be over 200 million so i would say so maybe 200 million is close yeah because the whole of the east africa is uh speaking the language but uh there is also um you know the central africa uh because of um, wars in yeah. Congo, mm. we have hosted many of the refugees and, and they adapted to the language very, very easily. It became yeah. their first language and they brought it back home. And then the Southern African countries, for example, in Malawi, you can find some Zambia as well mm. speaking, not exactly in South Africa, but uh, yeah. in those countries. And, and when we speak about East Africa, we mainly think about Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, Rwanda, Burundi, Burundi. Yes. Yeah. And then the central is also with uh, Congo, Democratic Republic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They, yeah they... I, I actually can remember seeing a few documentaries about the Democratic Republic of Congo and hearing Swahili. And I was like, hey, I, I can I can understand a few words here and there. Yeah. Yeah. It's because of the um, situation, uh, war situation, so many refugees came to Tanzania. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was it the is it Kivu Kivu region in Congo, <laughs> which is uh, yeah. borders with uh, Tanzania in in this south south uh, mm -hmm. east? Somewhere. We don't. Um, <clears throat> let's see, Rwanda Burundi for sure. Uh, possibly we have Lake Kivu. Yes. But I doubt we have the direct connection. Uh, like, let, you, I think there is, if I remember correctly. Do you think there is no land border between Tanzania and Congo? Yeah, because um, I need to check to be sure to to confirm. Yeah, that. it's uh, oh yeah yeah yeah. It's only the lake. But yeah. Yeah, the lake is, but um, uh, we are, uh, because, you know, uh, there is Lake Victoria, then Nairobi, Kenya, and uh, then uh, we have uh, yeah. Uganda on top of us. Yeah, uh, I checked. The, there is no land. Yeah, we don't have a land uh, land connection uh, with, uh, with Congo as such. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so, so they kind of flew over the Lake Victoria uh, or so to come to Tanzania as, as refugees. Yeah. Uh, by the way, are, are there any German speakers in anywhere Tanzania? Because, I mean, the last colonial power was uh, the British, mm -hmm. uh, but no, Zanzibar wasn't, or was it? Zanzibar was a autonomous, was it also... What, what, yes. what, Zanzibar uh, and Tanganyika were both uh, British co uh, colonies before. Yes, but before yes, merging. At some point, yes. Uh, but uh, especially the mainland, mainland had been with British quite a lot. Uh, the Sultanate of Oman uh, was in probably predominantly yeah. in, in Zanzibar. Yeah, in Zanzibar for two, three hundred years, quite a long time. Yeah, for quite a long time. 
and then the okay. British came later, I think. Uh, after um, after the Germans, so yeah, we, after the Germans like and a, Portuguese, you know, and Italians were also in Zanzibar. Oh, okay. Yes, surprise, surprise. So when you go to Zanzibar, you might speak some Italian, and some Zanzibaris could get it. Okay. Uh, but also when you look, uh, some, there is some kind of Italy connection. I didn't know okay. about myself. Yeah. Yeah, but Portuguese definitely. Uh, um, Germans uh, and then uh, Brits were the last ones. But uh, Zanzibar never was part of uh, German East Africa, right? Okay. Yeah, no, I, I don't. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think maybe it's uh, important to mention to people that Tanzania is the result of two parts merging: Tanganyika exactly. and Zanzibar. So Tan, exactly. Zan, and just Ia in the end. So Tanzania. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how, how many times have you been in Zanzibar? <laughs> you know... Uh, uh, too many to count. No, 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 no. Actually oh. not. I can okay. count. Okay, I okay. In, I have been in Zanzibar as much as I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just once. Just once. <laughs> yeah. Although uh, you have to take the boat from Dar es Salaam always. Isn't it the like uh, closest place? Yes, and it's a two-hour boat, so you can take it many yeah. times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know... Um, Zanzibar is very touristic, um, and yeah. um, it's um, all these touristic things are business as usual in, mm -hmm. in, in Tanzanian people's eyes. Yeah, but for people who are coming from abroad, they're excited about the water and the sea, and they really want to go and explore. And but for others, it was like, okay, Zanzibar, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, for example, when you are working, working up from my grandmother's home, you are in the balcony, you see, oh, Mount Kilimanjaro is there. So what's the big deal about it? It's Mount Kilimanjaro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but then when you travel to come uh, and you've met friends and, oh, have you climbed Kilimanjaro? Uh, and then you realize, okay, so this is a big deal. I should go and climb. <laughs> <laughs> and then you go to Zanzibar. Have you gone to Zanzibar? Yes, I have been there. And it's like, okay. Just to answer a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what do you think, you as a as a Tanzania? What what are the most like interesting places in Tanzania that you have visited? If if uh, there are some places that you think are too touristic, like Zanzibar, or which are too normal, like Kilimanjaro, because you have been like uh, grown up seeing it quite. A lot. Yeah, I think it's touristic, Kilimanjaro as well. Uh, yeah. Arusha is also very touristic. Yeah. But you know, um, it depends with what perspective you're speaking about. If if I speak about uh, this as um, uh, a person from a foreign countries, obviously I will say the historic destinations. Um, so speaking about Bagamoyo, speaking about which is of course in the mainland, speaking about uh, Zanzibar, uh, speaking about Kilimanjaro, and speaking about the safaris, the different safaris we have in uh, in uh, Northern Africa, Tanzania, or, or then in the Southern Islands uh, of um, uh, Tanzania as well, in Ikumi, for example, Ngorongoro and yeah. the Central Bats. But then if I, th I, I think about uh, like Tanzania, uh, what is most interesting, I would say uh, I would go to the Doma, I would go to the Restlam, I'll go to Morogoro, I'll go to the southern Tanzania, you know, um, uh, because there is a lot of um, uh, history, but also the Restlam itself, obviously, uh, but also it tells you the importance of the country. Uh, the Doma is the capital city, or uh, not capital city, but capital. Um, uh, it's a capital city, I would say, where our governments and everybody should be there. Yeah. Um, but nobody really cares about it. Okay. Yeah. Everybody wants to be in the Islam because it's very Western, it's fashionable, you know, these type of things. But of course, it's important to be there because you have the whole the harbor that connects uh, most of the landlocked countries of Africa in Dar es Salaam, but also you have a lot, like that's the meeting point of people from all over the country. Okay. So you will meet people from Kilimanjaro, you meet people from Iringa, you meet people from everywhere uh, in yeah. the country. 
and you have an opportunity also to uh, uh, meet people from all over the world too. I mean, who are coming mm -hmm. and landing. The main airport and everything are all there. Yeah. Uh, in the southern of Tanzania, this is kind of a forgotten place, but it's also a connecting uh, element with our southern friends uh, and uh, still a lot of um, um, history uh, and connection. Obviously, we talk about the East African connection, but then the southern part, we are connected also with very meaningful partners. Yeah. Uh, for example, already Mozambique, Mozambique and Mtwara, they are close by. And Mtwara nowadays is kind of a, a gas uh, type of, uh, of, 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 of a city or, or region. And um, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a learning opportunity, but also it's interesting to see that uh, when the two nations are meeting, that's where the kind of similarities are starting to, uh, to merge and then you realize is how you are the way you are okay so the people Makonde people and the people of Mozambique they are very close if you look at them uh, the similarities are, are clear but the Mozambican peoples don't speak necessarily a lot of English because they're Portuguese mm. uh, you know so uh, and, do you and think so Portuguese is maybe more common in the Tanzanian border with Mozambique or or can you, say, find, can you find can you find some people yes. who, who who speak there uh some portuguese yes in in, in the mm -hmm. in the very southern parts yes you can find some some people uh and especially since there is this kind of entry points and i think there can also be some swahili speakers in some mozambican uh, uh, areas or cities so i'll say yeah and uh when you meet uh, other tanzanians do you speak english or swahili and are there any any uh, situations where you have met Tanzanians who don't speak Swahili or uh, Sw uh, English? No. And what do you do in that situation so, that yeah. happens? I think every Tanzanian will speak Swahili. Yeah. If a Tanzanian will not speak Swahili, that is a Tanzania who is maybe born outside of the country and has not lived in Tanzania at all. Okay, okay. Yes. So everyone in Tanzania can speak Swahili. Yes, I would. I would say ninety-eight percent. Yeah. And the person who won't speak Swahili is maybe the really, really granny. I mean, you know, I'm already on my forties now, <laughs> so my yeah. parents are already the grannies. <laughs> yeah. Those grannies on top of my parents, those I could say that might not speak a lot of Swahili. Okay. But the grannies on my parents' level, if they don't speak Swahili, then there will be those who are really, really uh, rural and haven't been exposed to anything. But I doubt because the Maasai's are the people that you could find like really kind of uh, people of heritage, they have kept it, but they speak Swahili too. Yeah. Our radios and everything, there is no radio which speaks ethnic language. Okay. Maybe they have started recently, but yeah. the national radio will speak Swahili and the news are in Swahili and everything. So people listen to those and understand. Yeah. So every Tanzanian will speak Swahili. How good is the level of the language? Now it depends within which and what purposes. Mm. Um, that um, in Finland you have the Selkos Swami, yeah. uh, the everyday uh, speech. Uh, you can say, uh, uh, I'm going there yesterday, for example. Um, there are a lot of Selkos Swahili speakers too. Mm. <laughs> uh, and um, the people who are speaking perfect Swahili. For example, I wouldn't put myself in that like um, phonologically perfect speaking. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Uh, because my, my Swahili is to the level of speaking, getting to understand, writing a letter, yeah. and possibly passing an exam. I think that was one of the most difficult class in my school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, not only me, many of my friends too, uh, because you really have to uh, detail the language. Yeah. 
for example, if you want to say, um, if I had money, I could buy a plane. You have to say, Ninge likuwa na pesa, ninge nunuandege. And I would say, ninge kuwa na pesa, ninge nunuandege. But the li, which is missing there, is already um, an issue. Okay. Language. And it is too expensive. Yeah. You have to say, ni grali sana. Grali, you know, it's half to. Uh, and I could say, Gali Sama, mm. you know. So uh, if I take a test right now, yeah. and many other, I could assure you, many, 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 many other Tanzanians, if you put them on a pot and giving them a test right now uh, to check how do they justify the details, you will realize that there are a lot of this forgetting LI, you know, like forgetting A with dots in Finland. Mm -hmm. Then there are a lot of those. We, we, are, we are many, majority. Mm -hmm. And then there are only a few, or oh, a good number, but still I would say fewer than normal of those who really speak, speak the language. But at the end of the day, everybody understands everyone. Yeah. Uh, yeah, these little justifications, slangs, uh, kind of, and the words are growing every day. People are now realizing that sometimes so, so he must be documented in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, for example, when I left the country 20 years ago, um, the television uh, didn't have a, a name that is public. But only when I came here, I realized that um, television finally has a Swahili name. You know, now it's called Runinga. And there are so many other gadgets title of names now came up and so what's so, television uh, runinga runinga yeah okay that's a swahili name for television yeah so during our times and i would say even during the my parents age mid 70s what well, <laughs> i would go back maybe 50s 60s because the mid 70s were taught by colonial era, yeah. uh, you know. But during my time, the language was taught as a language. Uh, when, uh, so when were you born? When you refer to my, my, my time. Yeah, 1980s. Yeah. I was born in 1980. So, and I started my school in 1987, 86, uh, before I was, you know, of course, daycares. But 1987, I went to class one yeah. when you were seven years old. But during that time, you were taught Swahili, for example, in naturally in class three or four if i remember correct you are taught it as it should have been but nobody paid attention how you spell it you know and that's why there is a lot of this generalization of how Israeli is spoken very generally uh, yes people understand you but when you put a book mm. And say, let us now, if you have an uh, artificial intelligence equipment to say to somebody, okay, read this story for, or tell me mm. about your situation in Swahili. Then they start to speak. There will be a lot of beeping or red marks. <laughs> because yeah. there, there are some NGA forgotten because someone put all G, uh, you know, um, Li forgetting, you know, there are many uh, justification of past, future, and you know. So is logic. this is this because all the material online uh, has been written by so many different people with different levels of Swahili that the AI, which uses these as samples, then makes the mistakes that because it cannot find the like it cannot decide which one is correct because there are so there is so much variation so that there's, there's a lot of variation of, of the language oh. as well yes so that is that is a challenge it's getting to the better now people are realizing the for example the teachers are getting much more recognized especially the language teachers swahili language teachers um they were just teachers who were teaching swahili many times there were people who graduated and who were originated let's say from zanzibar or coastal areas who knew the language and come to teach. Yeah. 
the only time I passed Swahili with a B, and the B was starting, um, I think, on 75 to 80 something, if not 81 to 90. The very first time I was in my uh, form four, which is 11th grade equivalent national examinations. Mm. And I felt like, wow. And the, ma the main question which I didn't like in the exam was if I opened the examination, I found out there was some big um, AC, then I have, I have to highlight the meaning of the vocabularies. Mm. Holy, it, it, it always ate my marks there and it has always had 10 marks. Yeah. So if you miss that one, that means your A has gone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, 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 an, it's not an easy language to study. Uh, it could be specialized. I was chosen to go and specialize in Swahili, French and English, for example, after my, my high school. Oh, my okay. Grade 11. Because you have 11, so seven years, then four years, and then two years. Yeah. Yeah. So 13 years of school. The two years are the from five and six, that is high school. Yeah. And on the 11, because I did so well on Swahili, because I was practicing a lot, mm -hmm. I was given opportunity to go and specialize in languages. And I was like, okay, what am I going to be? Because yeah. I passed based on the, on the <laughs> practice of the past papers. Then I yeah. decided that I don't take that. <laughs> yeah. So you had French also in high school. Yes, uh, in, in my junior high, I studied French as well. <laughs> how was that? And how is your French now? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't think I remember anything, but <laughs> no, I, I think I remember. I just don't speak it because I have visited Paris a few times and Always when I'm there for one week, towards the end of the week, I'm able to talk French to somebody in the in the train. You know, the Parisians speak French only all the time. Uh, but other than that, it feels like ooh, they are they are pulling these words to me. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think if I am poured now into the French environment for a week, mm -hmm. after that it will start to come. Uh, and the only challenge I would have to kind of make it ready within fit within one year would be to to justify the uh, formation of sentences uh, clearly and managing the accent. But otherwise, I would be able to go to places by asking uh, and meeting people, for example, and if possible, even reading a speech and, and writing. Mm, okay. I got a C in my junior high. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I felt so. so proud. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the languages that you have some kind of knowledge uh, until that time uh, was Chaga, then Swahili, English, and then uh, French was like fourth language that you started learning. Or was there something in your school time, other languages as well, uh, in addition no. to this? OK. And... Just French. Uh, I have uh, <laughs> I have I have read uh, and at least my dad uh, <laughs> assisted teach a little bit uh, some Swedish, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah. Uh, but um, it wasn't uh, kind of uh, a language uh, for me. Yeah, but Swedish, uh, that was here in Finland. No, uh, in, in Tanzania. In Tanzania? Uh, <laughs> Why on earth? <laughs> yeah, because Svenska, my dad spoke Swedish. Uh, he has made some international careers. Your, your dad speaks Swedish. Yeah, he spoke, he spoke Swedish. Uh, yeah. Uh, he has made an international career, and one of which been in, in Sweden. And we had this Swedish book, course book at home, where time to time we were reading. And uh, the reason why I started to read this book is because in 1990s, I had, uh, you remember, I don't know if you remember, pen friends, uh, you know. I can remember, yeah. Yeah, uh, I had a pen friend from Sweden, Luli. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. And uh, then I started to think maybe I should be writing to her in Swedish. She was a her in Swedish. And uh, then I started to read this Gomorrah type of things. Yeah. yeah. I should have known because I have uh, been in the environment, but very young. 
Yeah. Uh, but um, then that's the reason why the book came up. I didn't know even if we have the book, but when my father heard that I have a pen friend and then he said, oh, actually there is a book here. Oh, um, yeah. So, so your dad and your mom or just your dad lived in Sweden for a while because of his career <laughs> before, your, you, yes. before you were born? Uh, yes, and after I was born as well. Okay. So it's it's a on and off type of a career thing. Okay, what, what kind of work did he do? He's an economist, so he worked with some different economic uh, related issues. I think some Subscania, uh, and also before that, he went also to school in, uh, in, uh, in a Swedish institution. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Uh, and you, how did you end up in Finland 20 years ago? <laughs> Or what year was it when you moved to Finland? In 2002. It's funny because there was an article published to do with me last week and they say that I was here in 2007, but I started working in 2007. Yeah. But I came I came to Finland in 2002. And um, the reason why I was here is, to, is because of just what we discussed. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> when Finland came to the table, it was like, well, it's an Nordic country. We know it well. We yeah. should go there. So Just what kind of, what kind of work? So so what uh, kind of work did you do? No, I did I, I didn't do any work. I came here to study. Study, okay, but, okay. Yeah, but you know, when you are young, going to study abroad, at least for my 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 country, your parents are responsible of your financial life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or they they are the financial guides, mm -hmm. so to say. And <laughs> when I was very interested to go to Australia, so I can have the sea. <laughs> Yeah, the sea and everything, but also I had interested interest to study political sciences, international relations, because that was my channel after mm -hmm. high school, and become a humanitarian lawyer. But then, when Finland came with the social work uh, degrees, and the justification was that you can work on humanitarian uh, elements, I thought, why not? Okay. Uh, so, my parents thought thought because of course they buy the plane ticket. <laughs> but Finland would be better than <laughs> Australia. Was it and that cheaper? Is, the plane ticket? It, was, it would be better. You know, it became to be cheaper after I was here and realized that we do not pay tuition fee here. Oh, okay. In Australia, they had tuition fees. Oh, it was not a very cheap place to study. Yeah, but the reason why I landed here to write an examination in order to study here in Australia, I had a full direct admission, was that um, it was cheaper to, to uh, uh, not cheaper, but it was safer for a young man to study in a Nordic country than to go to the Australian uh, uh, cities which of course came from the examples from some friends that, you know, all the issues to do with the drugs and alcohol and everything else. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and the reason why this was chosen is just because of the Swedish experience we just discussed. Yeah. But then, yeah, I came here, I came here to write an exam and apparently I passed and I started to study here. Where? In, In Helsinki? Or... Uh, yes, I studied La La Laurea actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. In the same school where where you ended up uh, working and where we met actually for for the yeah. first time when I was studying there. Exactly. <laughs> so and... that's 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 the reasoning. Then I started after five years. Uh, I got uh, uh, yeah, I got uh, four and a half, I think. Uh, I got an uh, internship and then I worked. I started working here, and that's the. <laughs> Life ever since. Huh? <laughs> so you were, you started working uh, in Laurea, or did you have some other job between before Laurea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you yeah. mean other jobs? I've done a lot like of uh, yeah. I was thinking bit at, after uh, between graduation and working Laurea, but yeah, you, you said you after after that started. Yeah, I was working here already when I was studying. Mm, yeah. As an intern, yeah, yeah and then yeah. I, I started. But I've done a lot of works. I mean, uh, I, I wouldn't say, you know, <laughs> usually I speak to, to many of friends, uh, young students arriving, and they think, oh, well, well you are lucky as no, no, no. I, I have gone, 
when I when you go to Prisma <laughs> Truxlet uh, or uh, Prisma Lepervira <laughs> to the Sivos Comero, when they see me, they might start dancing because they might think, oh, where have you been all this time? <laughs> <laughs> so I've done a share of uh, all the necessary works to get myself uh, living here. Yeah. So, so you were in Prisma uh, in the in the supermarket uh, also. I, I worked actually in, with Lassila and Tikanoya. Lassila and Tikanoya, yeah. So uh, transportation. I've, I've done cleaning services. Oh, cleaning. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cleaning services. Yeah. I did that for my second year until my third and a half. Uh, and then I, or maybe fourth, close to fourth year, then I was already graduated in my social work education and realized that uh, it's not going to lead me towards my humanitarian law uh, mm -hmm. studies. And I was studying already business. Yeah. Meanwhile, I work at the daycare. Yeah. Uh, so through the gigs of Selway, I worked with different daycares around uh, Helsinki mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, and that was an eye-opening because I learned a lot of Finnish language with kids. Which yeah, they would... are the best teachers. My my wife learned more, yeah a lot of Finnish uh, in the beginning from kids as as yeah. she was a uh, an au pair. Yeah, so daycare daycare is the best. Best experience uh, of learning, 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 learning place uh, that you can find. Yeah. Did they correct all your mistakes, or or how was? Sometimes, it? but most of the time they listened until when they asked questions until when they understood. Okay. <laughs> and that that was really nice. Um, and I must say that's the first time I could feel a bit comfortable to speak my Finnish to somebody. Yeah. And what year was this? After this how many years of in 2006. It? Yeah. After four, the four, 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 so that was fourth or fifth year. Yeah, fourth year and a half to to be here. The first year I wouldn't I didn't do pretty much anything. I was just my parents supported me. I'm very grateful that that was possible because mm -hmm. this is not a very cheap country to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's the reason why I was trying to open my eyes and see where where can um, opportunities be formed. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't something that I wanted to do for a very long time. I, I tended to be ambitious quite a lot, and I realized the possibilities yeah. uh, in different places. Mm -hmm. yeah. And about learning Finnish, how, how has it been? And what what's your level currently? How much do you use Finnish? And <laughs> I don't know what's my level actually. Um, I am. I can evaluate myself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if uh, I think I am close to B one, mm -hmm. I'm bragging that, but yeah. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I cannot write as such as much, uh, but uh, I can. Uh, I can understand very well. Um, I'm still, I think, quite preserved when it comes to speaking. I try nowadays more more than before, but I can speak at the daycare with the daycare teachers. I mean, they, they are very welcoming, so we can have a chat. Uh, uh, my my kids we speak English together because I need them to get the language languages because they are learning proper Finnish at the daycare. So yeah. I don't want to stop that. Uh, but uh, in my work, we work mostly in English or then in Finnish. So in those situations which require Finnish, I have to really wear the <sighs> clothes of strength and, and speak. But uh, when I start to speak, I think I can give a speech and finish to a certain level. Yeah. As well. so, so maybe we can make uh, in the future... A, pod, a whole <laughs> podcast in Finnish, maybe in a few years. We can try. <laughs> we can try. <laughs> okay, I, I promise we will. I, I we will make it in Swahili, 
and then in Finnish both. So yes. we are we are even then. We can be flexible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what do you think? Why? What's the difficulty in learning Finnish? Mm. For you. You know. Usually, I think the language learning is a responsibility of yourself. But um, for me, I think the only difficulty is that I just didn't have enough time to learn. Yeah. And um, I went to finish courses when I was a student. And as I said, I tended to be a little bit ambitious type of a student. My, work, my brains were on keeping on graduating. Yeah. So I didn't explore. Uh, because you know, my brain was shouting, go work at the United Nations, you know, find this type of a task and job somewhere in an international environment. That's my blood. And then I realized, oops, I've graduated the first degree. Oh my God, I'm now doing a business degree. Then I got these jobs at Laurea. Again, that ambitious thing came in and I started to kind of just grind working yeah. hard uh, and no time to think the language because you can affect with english here uh that's that's the thing but uh, i have mentioned many times uh, i was lucky to be in a group uh, organized by the ministry of education here on behalf of my job uh, to discuss the internationalization of uh, finland or finnish education and my point was that if we really need foreigners to speak English or Finnish here in Finland, is to tell them that the first six months is Finnish. Yeah. Point. Like they come to school morning to evening. This is a Finnish speaking teaching. Concepts right for their areas of studies. And then they should be constantly checked in a way that after the six months, those who have graduated will go on studying. They can study in English, but there should be a mandate, mandate for example, to tell them, okay, during your 100 whatever degree, you should do 30 ECTS in Finnish as elective courses. Yeah. yeah. That would help uh, because then you are told, you are forced to read Finnish uh, languages to pass your examinations and yeah. so forth. And then you can graduate with your English degree. As the same they're doing for many of the of the of the uh, Finnish taught programs that you have half an, uh, one semester fully taught in English. So go there, do English courses. Mm. That could make it possible because yeah. you have half a semester to do the language courses. They could tailor it in a way that you graduate with it. Nowadays, students graduate so quickly if they want to graduate so quickly. So the question of time wouldn't be there. But then uh, getting them now go to school start to study whatever degree program they're studying and tell them to take at least three courses or whatever semester in Finnish so mm. they can pass those exams. Yeah, It helps many, many things because the discussions are in Finnish, so it's natural. You know, if you want to discuss when you go to the shop, they realize, oh, your Finnish is broken, they will change it mm. uh, to English so they can sell their things and then you can go home. Yeah. But if it was uh, in a way that you're studying with, um, uh, Finnish colleagues in a Finnish uh, requiring uh, class. So the first meeting you will be quiet. The second one you need to present. So you will present. Mm. You know, we we all uh, learn to present uh, in your own bedroom. Like, oh, this is how I should present tomorrow. Yeah. Put the words together, because the problem problem is not wording. The problem is speaking it out. Uh, but. For example, even now, I realize that in all of the occasions, I'm kind of constantly busy, mm. you know. And if I get a possibility to speak English, I can make things happen very quickly. Yeah. Uh, if I have to use a finish, I have to take a little time to, to, to finish. And sometimes it will delay. Yeah. Because then there are these multiple, and maybe my work environment also, mm. because it requires a lot of English. So... I wouldn't say that it was challenging, but I think I think only the setup didn't push me to the understanding of the language from the day one. Mm -hmm. And what what is actually your role in uh, Laura? It's something with the internationalization because 
I can't remember now your title, mm -hmm. but I, I met you when I was trying to find uh, an internship abroad. Um, so I can remember meeting you for the first time then. Uh, so mm -hmm. what, are you still in Laurea and what's your title? Yes, yeah, or, so or what do you do specialist there? in international international affairs. Uh, I'm responsible for all the international networks of the institution. This is a very new task uh, and funding for education related projects and joint programs. Yeah. And what kind so of kind programs? Of developing yeah. So programs. is there something interesting going on now that you want to mention about uh, uh, Laurea's uh, international internationalization programs, for mm -hmm. example? Yes, every, every day there is something interesting, interesting happening. I mean, we we have um, um, we have the European University Network going on right now. We are trying to get uh, 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 the status uh, from the European Union. So ten of our institutions across Europe will make one big institution. Uh, that's mm. one of the work that's going on, and, and then. Um, um, more possibilities, I mean, uh, are opening up for students, especially those who cannot go abroad uh, nowadays. They can be granted to go somewhere for um, a week, uh, pro provided they join a blended um, uh, program uh, of study. Um, I think that's that's really really interesting, and they're more more popular uh, in, in in such. Uh, more and more projects across. Uh, uh, the globe, uh, meaning also outside of Europe. Mm. So students are designed and coming up. Uh, so you were into Gorilla Campus. So we, we have uh, now stu uh, students projects with uh, United States, for example, uh, Chile, uh, and more will come, we hope. Uh, Meaning that students will study with the students in the USA or Chile, and they will have a one week experience during this project team in there, and the co counterparts will come to Finland during the life cycle of the project. So, so ex exchange programs? Uh, yeah, it's kind of an exchange, but it's a short one. So you don't short have to stay there for yeah, the whole okay. semester. Yeah. And you are granted for that. Mm. And what do you think? Uh, is it important to learn languages if some students are uh, listening to this uh, and they think wh whether they should like learn languages in school? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it's very important. I mean, I could learn more languages if I could <laughs> during my time. Uh, more possibilities are now uh, available because um, yeah, <laughs> and especially when you're a student and especially when you are not committed to any type of family affairs. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I am on the advantage side because I'm a foreigner here in Finland. So I am learning now more Finnish because my kids' middle language is Finnish. Mm. They speak Finnish together. So yeah. Finnish is not running away from my home. And that has helped me a lot to listen and grasp meaning of things yeah. because they speak only the right things. You yeah. know? <laughs> so, but I would imagine if it's a Finnish person, kids are going to Finland and so it, it Finnish daycare. So it, it becomes a bit of a, you don't get much more from there. But in terms of learning uh, other languages, especially if you don't have so much responsibilities, um, it's it's something that I could do. Uh, yeah, I wanted to perfect my French, obviously, and maybe I'll perfect it when I, I grow. I think I still have it somewhere behind my brains. Yeah, <laughs> some, some remnants of your your French. <laughs> exactly, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, I would love to. Uh, actually, I I knew some uh, Dutch uh, from the Netherlands as well, some basics uh, as well. And Germany language I would like to study. I like the way it sounds. I like how it is kind of made to feel perfect, you know, this type of things. Mm. But I think the most important thing in language learning is you should know how to place yourself into the society that will first receive you. Yeah. Yeah. And I can tell you this is very important and has been for me as well. When I went to Seure, Seure, this recruitment agency here, the question they asked me, 
was Bukut Koswoman. You know, I was there with my friend who is uh, late by now. He said no. He was the first one online and we went with a mission of getting the job interview. Then I, I, I said, Kula. Yeah. Bukut Koswoman, Kula. Mina yeah. Then they asked me for the interview. It was an immediate interview. Go to yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Then when I was walking to the room, I was like, oh my God, what am I? Where am I going right now? <laughs> 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 then I sit down and the first question was obviously, tell yourself, who are you? Yeah. That was not a problem. Because that was what I did when I called Lassila Tikanoi. I had my A4, thanks to my Finnish language teacher for correcting that. It was perfect. Yeah. It was on the phone, hey, you know, and Conrad, pop, 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 the whole story. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. person who didn't have a moment to speak. So I answered all the questions on my ASA, which I was reading. Okay. I was asked to go to Lassila yeah. Tikanoi office. But now I'm in Seure. I have to sit here in front of the lady. I don't have a paper. Yeah. So tell me about yourself because I have done 100 times calling and read my story. Yeah. I just poured out my story right yeah. there. And I had a degree now in social work, which I decorated it onto my story too. And she was very excited. And she asked me how long you are in Finland. What do you want to do? I understood. Then another question came and I was like, okay. Now we are here. Yeah. <laughs> what did you just say, madam? <laughs> yeah. Yes. And then she looked at me. She smiled. She said it in English to me. Oh. Then I started to answer in English. Pop, 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 pop. And then uh, she asked me in English, are you able to come on a call basis? Because your Finnish is still developing. Then I said, yes, I'm available on a call basis. So that was my first place because I knew this introductory part clearly. Yeah. I didn't just crane it. I kind of internalized that. Yeah. Uh, I got to be in kind of a position and she trusted that I could speak because then she um, was able to justify things in English as well. Mm. Then yeah. next day, literally I got a phone call to go to the daycare to speak, to, to do the work. And I was pretty much doing the morning, helping kids to uh, to eat. When they finish, I put the dishes in the, in the uh, machine. Then I go to their room where I put the pea clothes into the machine mm. and then fold the ones which are ready and iron them. And then you just go to hang with the kids, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that was very easy. And kids were always, I was the only guy around the daycare mm -hmm. from Africa. So I was interesting. Yeah. They always would come around me. Then I sit down yeah. with the book and yeah. they always want to touch me and ask me questions. Then oh I was like, okay. So the daycares really, really liked me for that because I spoke my broken uh, Finnish with the yeah. kids mm -hmm. uh, while learning at the same time, obviously. And, and so, you know, yeah. so... I think in learning any languages, whether you're going to just be a tourist abroad or you're going to, to, to apply for the job somewhere, it's very important to learn the first um, concepts that get you to be accepted mm. somehow. Yeah. If believability is very important. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think it's enough when you go to Germany and say, good morning, uh, and, and then they shake hand back. Uh, that's already like, oh, so. And then things, other things will follow. Mm -hmm. Perfectionism in languages, of course you can if you have time, but if you don't have time, it's enough to know the, how do you say, cell call? I mean, you tra <laughs> trailblaze the, uh, the language concepts while mm -hmm. explaining. My sister yeah. was in Austria. She landed from Tanzania, my cousin's sister, sorry. Landed in, uh, from Tanzania and she was, in Adina, she had all this group of administration people who were living in the same buildings because she was a scholarship student who spoke only German. And then, oh, immediately, what can I say here? 
I don't know where to put the banana uh, leaves or covers. Mm -hmm. where, where do I put them? Then she asked, oh, where do I put, in German, where do I put these bananas clothes? Mm. You, know. <laughs> you know. And they understood, oh, okay, that's what she means. They helped. Yeah. But she didn't speak perfect, but she got to be uh, on the point while demonstrating it. Yeah. So I think that, that could be my first um, um, justification. But also paying attention that you respect the language because sometimes uh, we use these languages in a way that we don't respect them. And that can be a little bit like, like I think ac accidentally, you mean, or yeah, when you don't know the language well, yeah, enough. yeah, because uh, I have seen I've heard people speaking even English in a very insultful matter, manner, which um, uh, for them they feel like when they speak like that, they get more credibility to look like they know better, they are more open minded uh, American type of vibe. Okay. But for some people that can be very insultful. So I think while respecting the language, politeness, setup of the language and you know, basics. That would be my my thinking for yeah. the first time. I still have uh, one final question. We uh we are running out of time. So uh, the last question is after living 20 years in Finland, are are there things in Finland, like cultural things or in the language that have surprised you? And maybe if after living here for so long, when you go back to Tanzania, uh, have there been like things that now when you go there, you're like, why is this like this? Because you are so used to living in Finland. Oh, yeah, I mean... <laughs> there will always be things. I mean, yeah. Tanzania is in the African continent. Finland is in Northern Europe. <laughs> uh, I think from Finland, uh, the the things that surprise me till today is going to sauna naked. Why is it? Surprising? I have never, I have never uh, concepted that. Uh, Do you, and oh. you don't still go to sauna, or I can go there with my family or very close people. I don't just meet people and then we go to sauna, you know, it's... It, it feels place. awkward? It feels very awkward. And uh, and of course, this is with respect uh, to my uh, cultural upbringing mm. as well. But also it's something that I fail to understand because for me and for my cultural background, your body is your responsibility. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But of course, I understand here, I mean... Um, that is a place where everybody is equal. I'm still pondering the equality element. <laughs> I, yeah, I understand. <laughs> I want to comment before you continue. I understand this really well, uh, <laughs> because I think most of, in most of the world, I think in in the majority of the world, in the majority of the countries, it's quite a taboo, like being naked with uh, strangers, but. Uh, here in Finland, it's quite different. And me as a Finn, it's uh, right from the birth, I'm used to it. So for me, it's mm -hmm. uh, no problem being naked in like yeah. any any place. But I understand yeah. your feelings. And probably as, a, as an adult, it's really hard to then adapt to a new way exactly. of thinking. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and... Uh... I think that's 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 pretty much the the one uh, one thing that surprises me to know. The other things I think I think the other thing which I see here are more or less the upgrades of what I have used to. Uh, I've seen different types of 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 uh, lifestyles, uh, but of course from Tanzania as a developing country, there are things that you are responsible because the society does not give mm. you that responsibility or possibility uh, in here you can call to the keller office and justify your issues and the keller office could try to organize something yeah. if you fill the boxes mm. and in a country like mine i mean you cannot uh the the reason that keller office keller office is your uncle and you know yeah. Uh, yeah so you have to respect them you have to say hello visit them quite often so that one day when you don't have school fees you could call you know to your uncle and uh, so they remember, oh, yeah. Uh, 
I see here young people go see their uncle, aunt, and they come in, uncle, aunt is carrying things. It's like, oh yeah, that's your things, so you carry them. <laughs> Uh, and I don't generalize because I've seen also many who are helping out things. Yeah. Uh, living in a Swedish-speaking corner of the Southern Europe, I, I see a lot of this type of... But uh, in my country, it's, oh, sitting in a bus and there is here a senior standing. It's like, wow. In my country, it's like, oh, can I help you? You know, let me help you. These type of things. Uh, so... I cannot compare those. Those are kind of things that you will never be able to think about in, in Tanzania. Mm. And um, I would take the both and put them on the plate. Yeah. And if I could smear them to mix, and whatever comes out of that would be the ideal situation. Because I don't very much uh, think that we should support people who are not motivated to do things. I would rather support those who are very motivated and have shown the motivation. Yeah. Because that could also boost this, like, okay, I don't do anything because the society will take care of me. Yeah. You know? Uh, so, but then when it comes to uh, Tanzania, what type of things? Um, uh, uh, what type of things uh, should I... Oh, surprise me. It's a question of timekeeping. Obviously, that will never be avoided. Um, <laughs> or being a very social society that you have to respect your neighbors, uncle, aunt, friends. Like sometimes you're just relaxed and your friend has arrived. Hi, come on, he's coming home. Okay, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, again, my friend. Or you were, couldn't you just call? You yeah. Know, yeah, a little bit. So uh, uh, that could be one of, uh, of the other things that I find awkward when I go back home. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I love my friends. I mean, we we are we are good in good terms and everything. But sometimes it's, I appreciate the finish where like, <laughs> okay, I would like to meet you tomorrow. <laughs> it's okay. Or usually, it's not like tomorrow. It's like uh, in, in next next month, uh, this For example, day. <laughs> yeah. You know, at least you know that. Oh, I'm expecting something. Yeah. So you know when you want to get rest. <laughs> so the question of timekeeping and this whole social society is, and of course, having been here for a very long time, sometimes uh, having been running also a company, a company in the country, sometimes you realize that how much of teaching you should do to get someone aligned to your thinking. Mm. So there is a lot of the Northern thinking, which is in my brain right now, that I forget the realities of the South. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But other than that, I think, um, uh, again, for the time, I would still keep the Finnish time uh, calling me when, especially now when you are a parent, you're working and you're busy, you know, even when you go home for a holiday, uh, but um, uh, for the aspects related to uh, society, uh, uh, respect, connecting, I think I would love to 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 uh, to be more social uh, with uh, my people around me. Yeah? yeah, but yet again, I would love to have some support from the state if I need it. Yeah, but as I said, if those two things could be smeared. Yeah, but for the sauna, I would still take the Tanzanian sauna. <laughs> okay. On Clovis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Is there still anything that comes into you, your mind that you want to mention here in the end? No, I mean, in relations to languages, uh, I would like to mention to the parents. I mean, uh, I have been having a lot of thoughts to, with the parents that will meet, um, especially international parents. I think the language of your child is where the child is born and raised. Uh, and the rest is just what you are working hard to do. Uh, we have a, a bit of a challenge uh, if you come from, like for my case, I'm a fully Tanzanian house. Mm. Uh, when you come from a similar country, you tend to push your kids sometimes to speak the language of your country, which is a great thing. Meanwhile, 
planning to live in this country for the rest of your life. And if the kid is not smart enough, he or she could lose quite a lot from the local language. So the balance there is really important in keeping consistency, which is difficult. I know I am I'm there. Um, but uh, ensuring that your kid is on two feet in a place where they are going to live is extremely important. Otherwise, we are making a big mistake. Um, and thank God, for example, here in Finland, uh, you have people who are, we have schools uh, like my own kids' daycare where is Swedish and Finnish. So they all constantly run two languages. Uh, and then when they come home, they speak Swahili and English. There is oh, another yeah. two languages. And yeah. the third one is the one they speak by themselves. Yeah. You realize that with this kind of a mild, dad speaks English, mom speaks Swahili, uh, and then um, or daycare speaks uh, Finnish with all the friends and <laughs> teachers. And then when you go to play in the yard, you hear some Swedish. Yeah. Somehow kids get this very naturally without getting being pushed to, no, 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 no. You are coming from Tanzania. Speak. This is your language. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, it's a little bit, uh, sometimes we make some, some mistakes, not necessarily Tanzanian parents, but many of the foreign, because we are scared that our languages will die. But uh, I think for the kids, if you only speak without even telling them to speak, they really catch it so so easily. Yeah. Uh, and it helps in the language development kid as well. So that's the only thing I could relate with as a, as a parent. And we have had many, many discussions, even actually a few minutes ago, mm. when we had two mothers at the lunch. That was a discussion. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I mean, uh, two minutes before we started this meeting. Yeah. There was a discussion like, oh, how, how does the American English come up in this <laughs> Finnish speaking environment? Yeah. <laughs> So this type of thing. So Somali, you know, uh, kids get it when you speak it, but no matter what, uh, they are more. They're going to be much more safer when they are really on two feet in a place where they are growing. It's not their fault. It's our fault. We were bringing them to to another place, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I think that's that's the that's the linguistic uh, advice I would give any parent uh, to keep yeah. their children in order. Okay, Asante Sana, the <laughs> podcast, uh, Conrad. It was really <laughs> nice to talk with you about these topics and hearing your uh, background more in detail, which I hadn't heard before, and speaking about languages of Tanzania and all the interesting things that happened in your life and how you came to Finland. So thanks for that. Welcome. Uh, and uh, Tutaunana Badaye. See you later. Karim sana tutaunana. Ha, ha, ha.